So what I'm going to be talking about is um, unpacking malware. And, and Doug uh, mentioned this a little bit, and sorry. He, he briefly touched on uh, malware and, and packers and, and reversing, um, but we're going to go in a little bit more in depth into it. Um, and so we're going to talk about you know what are packers you know why do we even care about them you know what what are they doing that you know, we want to try to unpack them um, we're going to talk a little bit how you can figure out uh, if uh, a malware or a piece of, or a binary has been packed um, how packers work and then we're going to talk about unpacking malware and what I should say too is that um, we're really going to be the focus of the presentation is how to manually unpack malware. Um, there are lots of programs that you can download, and we'll talk about these, that will just automatically unpack malware, or, uh, and, and my focus is going to be on malware, but there are a lot of programs that you can download that will just uh, uh, unpack, you know, whatever program you, you hand it to it that's, uh, that's been packed. Um, unfortunately, these don't always work, um, especially when you get into some of these advanced packers that I'll, I'll touch briefly on, which have all these anti-debugging and anti-analysis features within them. Um, the, the, the generic programs which you know, do all this stuff for you uh, don't quite work, and so you're going to have to do this on your own. So what are packers? Well, packers are essentially a program that's going to take another program and compress it. And then for that other program that it just compressed, it's going to wrap a decompression algorithm around that in that program. So you can think of it almost as like the, the Russian Matryoshka dolls. It's a program within a program. Uh, you know, on the outer shell here, you've got the unpacking uh, program called uh, this wrapper, which is going to take the program that's inside of it and unpack it into it into its original form. Now, the original reason packers were used was basically to save on bandwidth. Um, you know, if you can compress your program in size, then you don't need as much bandwidth to transfer it across the network. And years ago, when bandwidth was at a premium, when we only had the you know 10 slash 100 networks, transferring a was could take a while. Um, and so you needed to try, try to get them as small as possible. Um, well, a side effect of Packers is that as it compresses the uh, original program, it's going to obfuscate anything inside of it. You're not just going to be able to look at it and see you know, what embedded strings are in there um, in order to see you know, what it does. Uh, when Doug pulled up his program and you could see all the, the different error messages and the success messages, if that was a packed program, you wouldn't see those strings. You'd have to get through the outer layer of the packer in order to see everything inside of it. He touched also upon static analysis, which is looking at a program without actually executing it. You can't really do static analysis with a pack program. Well, you can, but you don't get. What you're, uh, but you're doing the static analysis on the packer itself. You're not doing it on the original program, the stuff that you really want to see, the, what you want to get up, down into. Now, over the years, packers have, I guess you could say, matured. Um, and they're really not used as much for normal, you know, benign programs. Um, every once in a while, you will see somebody use them, like Adobe. Uh, if you ever watch uh, the network traffic of an Adobe update, a lot of the programs that Adobe uh, brings down are packed, probably for bandwidth saving. And I don't know if they unpack them once they get down, but as they're going across the network, at least they're packed. Um, well, attackers obviously have have seen this. You know, the guys who write the hacker tool, the bad hacker tools, the uh, malware. They know that if they use a packer, it's going to make it more difficult for us to analyze it and figure out what's going on. Um, same for the antivirus companies. The antivirus companies have to get around these packers first in order to look and see what the virus is and write signatures for the virus. Um, so as these packers have matured and attackers have been using them more and more and developing them more and more, um, what we found is that they're actually adding anti-debugging and anti-analysis features in them. So the packer itself has protections from being debugged, from being unpacked, and from being um, even analyzed. Uh, there are some packers which have features that will detect if you're in a virtual machine or if you have something like Process Monitor or Process Explorer or any, uh, any of the other common tools that you use when you're, um, you're analyzing uh, a binary. So detecting packers. You know, how can we tell if a, uh, if a tool actually has a packer uh, applied to it? Um, well, there are a, really a large number of ways you can do this, and I'm only going to skim over them. Um, you can use signature or pattern-based tools. Uh, PEID is one, and that's PEID was uh, has has been kind of the standard for signature-based uh, file type detection and packer detection. Unfortunately, that has kind of gone away. Um, there, you can still find it, and you can still download it, but it's really not as common. 
but the big thing that came out of PEID is called the PEID database. And this was basically a huge text file of byte patterns for different packers, for different binaries, and so on. And so you'll see many other tools using um, the PEID database, which you can still download from a variety of locations, um, to uh, detect uh, you know, various file types and packers. Another tool is called TRID. Uh, this one is still being developed. Um, that's a great one for detecting packers. It actually uses patterns instead of signatures. Um, you can look at the entropy of a file. Now the entropy measures you know, how random a file is. Uh, the higher the entropy, the more random the file is, and therefore the more you know, likely it's, it's been packed, it's been compressed or encrypted. Um, when you're looking at packers, or when you're looking at any binary for that matter, you can look at what's called embedded strings. And now um, embedded strings are just like what uh, I mentioned before, like in Doug's program where it had, you had all the error messages uh, and so on. Um, those are known as embedded strings. And when you look at embedded strings in any file, or especially malware, you can get a lot of information out. You can get URLs, uh, file names that they're going to go into, registry keys they're going to modify. Sometimes you can even get the developer's names and, and things like that. Um, if you don't see very many packers, or I'm sorry, if you don't see very many strings, there's a good indication that the file has been packed because as the packer compresses the file, it's going to compress those strings as well. Um, and then imports. We're going to talk about imports in a second in more depth, but imports are essentially, um, now, you know, I'm going to skip that for right now. Uh, we'll talk about imports in a second. But if you see few imports, uh, that's a good, another good indication that, uh, you know, you're dealing with a, a packed executable. So what I want to do is as we go through this, I'm going to, um, we're going to be looking at. Why don't you bring your resolution down? Uh, I can try. Because I'm not getting a feed. <coughs> um, what we're going to do as we go through this <coughs> is. Yeah. <coughs> we're going to look at a, uh, a binary that's been packed. And we're going to, you know, just so you can see what it looks like when, you know, it is packed. So we have this one. This one has been, it's just a simple Hello World program that I've right. gotten it. And, just says, you know, thank you for executing me, and that's all it does. But it's been packed by a packer called UPX. Now, UPX is a very popular packer. It's open source, you can download it. It runs on a number of systems. It runs on Unix, Windows, uh, Macs, uh, mobile, some mobile systems that will run on, and so on. Um, but it's very popular, So it's e and it's also easy to look at and analyze. So what we can do is, I've got PEID here. I'm gonna open it up, and hopefully you guys can see this. Can you try one more time on the resolution? I can't go down anymore. Did it take it? Yeah. Um, you can see that, you know, just by putting in here, uh, the pattern detected that it's a UPX version 0 0.896 through 1.02 or 1.05 through 2.9. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the version of the packer is very important because as it, uh, as a program matures, a packing program matures, it will uh, look at um, the the, uh, the author may change the way that it packs a program. And so the methods you use to uh, unpack one version may differ from the one you use for another version. <clears throat> and just to show you in here, this is a bin text is a program that's used to uh, display embedded strings. Here we see, you know, from the uh, PE header, but as you scroll down, we're really not going to see too many readable strings. We've got something here where it says core, exit process, runtime minutes, some other stuff. Some broken up strings, um, but really not too many that we're going to consider to be um, readable strings. Now, over here, hopefully you guys can see this, but I'm pretty sure you can't change the font size. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, in this section right here, we have uh, the imports. Uh, these are the imports that are, are going to be brought in by the uh, the loader as it runs the Windows program. Now, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but essentially what imports are, um, there are functions that are stored in external DLLs. So, you know, when you compile a program and you call a system call, uh, in this case, let's say, you know, we have message box W, which is what popped up in the message box. Um, when you call that, that, that code isn't compiled into your program. You know, that's stored in the library somewhere. And to maintain um, uh, interoperability and, you know, make it so that code is more compatible as you move from system to system, um, the code is actually, the, the function called here, the message box W, is stored in a DLL, which could vary from system to system. Um, when this program loads, it actually goes out and it asks the operating system, you know, what's the address in memory for this function call? And this uh, message box W will actually get replaced with the memory address. And we'll see this a little bit farther. <clears throat> but one thing to note is, 
you know, typically with a packed program, if you only have a couple, uh, such as here you have load library, get proc address, some virtual uh, calls which protect and allocate memory, uh, an exit process, and so on, um, you don't, you're not going to, uh, if you have very few of these, you're likely dealing with a packer. And just to give you a, kind of an idea of a difference, actually, so I'm just loading this up in a P thing. This just parses the, the um, executable, making it easier to see. But here we can see, you know, this pack program has got six uh, imports from uh, kernel 32.dll and one from user 32, which is our message box. This really isn't a lot. When you compare that to, you compare that to, let's say, something like Notepad. Here we've got a whole bunch, you know, from this DLL we've got 10, kernel 32, we've got 71 different functions and it imports, user 32 is 75 and so on. And so you can see there's a big difference between the amount of imports you have in a program that hasn't been packed and versus one that hasn't been packed. That's just an example of, you know, what to look for. <coughs> So there are a couple terms that we're going to want to uh, know about as we go through. Um, and understand that I'm really just it's kind of skimming over a lot of this stuff. You know, there are papers and presentations um, galore about that go into, you know, just the PE header and how to uh, identify each uh, section in there in the structure and what each does. But we're just really glossing over to the important things. The first is called the entry point. And this is uh, this location in the header, it's uh, stored over here. Uh, in a section called the image file header, um, states where execution is going to begin. So when you run a program, this is the address of the first uh, instruction that's going to run. Now, when you talk about packing, you have something called the original entry point. This is the value of the entry point, this field here, before the program is packed. Because what's going to happen is when you unpack your program, or I'm sorry, when you run a program that's been packed, first thing that's going to run is the code that decompresses the, um, the code, the, the original program. Uh, once it gets done decompressing, it's going to need to know where to go to. Um, you know, what address does it jump to in order to start executing the original program? And that's the what's called the original entry point. Now, this is important because we want to find the original entry point when we're unpacking a program. We want to go through and we want to look for you know the very first uh, instruction from the original program because that's where we're going to be able to extract our original program from. Um, a couple more. Uh, one is called the image base. Um, this is the starting uh, memory address of the program. This is actually kept, uh, I believe, in the uh, image optional header, which ironically isn't exactly optional. It's actually required, but um, you know it's Microsoft, so whatever. Um, but the image base, this is the starting memory address of the program. So when a program loads into memory, it doesn't. Its very first struct instruction isn't going to be at zero 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 or memory address zero 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 zero. It's going to um, install somewhere else. It can actually, because of relocation and, and everything that can go on when you load a program, the, the um, image base can be anywhere in memory. Um, most of the time it's uh, 400,000 hex, but this is something that we want to uh, uh, keep uh, in our heads. So down here, you know, I'm, this is uh, you know, just a little representation of memory. You know, memory starts, uh, it goes the values go higher as you go, you know, logically up in memory. We've got our image base down here. Um, the next thing is called a relative virtual address. All right, this is the offset in memory um, from the image base. So let's say we had a variable that was, um, we wanted to have, you know, 14,000 hex from the image base. Its relative virtual address would be 14,000. Now, there's something else called the virtual address. Now, this is the uh, address of whatever uh, place in memory, whatever variable or, or pointer or whatever we have, that it's going to be the address of that uh, when it, the binary is loaded. So essentially, this is the image base up here, whatever this value is, plus the relative virtual address. So over here, let's say we have a virtual address at 414000x. The virtual address, or the relative virtual address, will then be 14,000x. I know this is probably kind of confusing, especially if this is one of the first times you're looking at memory. The, the big thing to take from this is, there, as we're unpacking things, sometimes there, 
we're going to be asked for the relative virtual address, which means that we need to take whatever address memory we find and subtract it from the image base to get that, uh, that, that value. And it'll make more sense when, once we get to that point. And finally, uh, we've got the import directory table and the import address table. And this is about the uh, imports that we talked about before. The functions that are, in, that are stored in DLLs that our program calls. So the import directory table is essentially a table in your program that's just a list of DLLs. Um, and it contains pointers into the import address table. Well, <clears throat> import address table has different values based off of where the program is. If the program is on disk, meaning you haven't executed yet, it's going to contain the names of all the, pro all the functions that you want to be able to call. So let's say we're looking, uh, this is our program on disk. Um, we could look at the import directory table and we see, you know, all right, we want to, we're calling something from user32. This contain, actually contains a pointer to somewhere in the, our program, the file, uh, the file to, uh, into the import address table, and it's going to, you know, contain all of these, all the different functions we want to load. Um, we have kernel 32, it's going to point to down here, uh, and so on. Um, in memory, though, what happens is, the, the loader, the Windows loader, the operating system is going to go through the import address table and it's going to find the memory location of each of these functions and replace the uh, value in here uh, with the memory location. So instead of, uh, if we look at this when it was in memory, which we will, um, instead of seeing load library A here, we'd actually see a memory address. Instead of seeing exit process, we'd see a memory address. And those memory addresses are where that function is in memory so that the uh, program can call. Any questions so far? too fast. So how do packers work? Well, a packer essentially compresses the code and the data within the program. Um, it's going to uh, place the unpacking code into the binary, uh, usually in what's called a, a, in another section. Typically this is called the stub code. Um, and then it's going to remove and save the original import address table. Um, and then it's going to modify the entry point to point the stub code. So it's probably hard to see in the background, but on the left side here, we have our original program with all the different sections. Um, sections are essentially just logical sections in the program which contain different types of data. So one section may be uh, actual code that gets executed, another may be data, one may be resources. Uh, typically, the, uh, the import address table will actually have its own section and so on. So what happens when we put it through a packer is, um, first it compresses all of this data um, through whatever means that it uses. It could compress it, it could encrypt it, it could, you know, do whatever. Um, it, somehow it's taking that original program and compressing it and obfuscating it from us. Then it's going to add that uh, it's unpacking code on there. So this is going to be the code that gets executed that decompresses the original program and runs it. Uh, next it's going to take the uh, import address table from our original program and remove it. Um, and it's going mostly for, uh, actually I don't know why it actually does that, um, probably to save space or, uh, as it originally did and to make it more difficult for us to figure out you know, what's going on, and so on. Um, and then it's going to modify the entry point over here to instead of pointing to somewhere over here where the original entry point is, it's going to point to some new entry point so it can start executing its code. Now, going the opposite way, what's going to happen? What happens when it gets unpacked? In? First, the stub code is going to run. It's going to unpack the original code. It's, it's going to uh, decompress it. It's going to decrypt it. Uh, and load that uh, decompressed or decrypted uh, program into memory. Then it's going to uh, reload the original uh, import address table. Um, the reason it has to do this is because you know, Windows loaded the original program and the import address table in there was for the packer. So we have to, so the packer actually has to recreate the original import address table so the program knows how to, uh, to call the functions that it needs to call. Um, the import directory table, this this one over here, is actually never reconstructed. Um, the reason being is this is really only used during uh, uh, image execution when it's first loaded up to point to where it needs to go to an import address table. Um, there are various offsets uh, in the uh, header um, that get loaded into memory, which tell it where to jump directly to the import address table. Um, so it never, once it, uh, when the packer who creates the original import address table, it actually never needs this. Uh, and then finally, uh, once it has the import address table restored, uh, it's, um, it jumps to the original entry point. This is the, the point in the original program that, uh, 
this is all right. All right. so sorry so after the import edge table is reconstructed uh, it jumps to the original entry point which is the point in the original program that execution would begin and then the original program that begins running all right so we went all through that you know who cares um, you know we, we already talked about that you know there are, are lots of ways that you can do this automatically uh, which I'll go into a little bit more in depth uh, later but sometimes you just need to actually get in there and get your hands dirty and, and do this um, unfortunately uh, there are a lot of packers out there which don't have unpackers for programs specifically made to unpack it and so you need to get in there and you need to figure out how you know this is working especially if you're dealing with malware um, and you want to see you know what files does this drop what network connections is it creating and, and so on so I'm, I'm really going to focus on unpacking malware. Now, we're going to focus on the bad executables, not necessarily, you know, to get around uh, copy protection or, or anything like that. We want to see, our goal here is to see, you know, what this malware is doing. Well, when you're unpacking malware, you're going to have one of two goals. Your, your one of two end goals, I should say. The first is visibility. Do you just want to see what that original program looked like? Um, or do you want to be able to execute it? Because execution is your second goal. And there are various steps that we're going to go through to get to either of these. Um, you know, sometimes we just want to see what the embedded strings in the executable were. Um, we don't necessarily want to be able to execute the program. Well, there are four methods that we can go through uh, to unpack malware. Um, I'm going to go through each of these. The first three I'm going to go through really fast because we're really here. I'm, I really want to focus on manually unpacking. So the first is our unpackers. Uh, uh, unpackers are basically programs which were have been created to unpack a specific packer. Um, UPX is a great example of this. You know, UPX is that popular packer, the open source one that I talked about at the beginning. It actually comes with a program to decompress it, anything that it packed. So it, it's actually its own unpacker. Um, for most of the other packers, you have to go out and you have to find if somebody has written a program which will unpack uh, a specific version of the packer that you're looking at. Um, it may be difficult to find these unpackers because a lot of people haven't gone through and uh, written programs made to you know open up whatever packer that is being used. Additionally, you're going to need to know the exact version and the exact packer that's being used. If you're off by one version and there were major major changes made in those ver between the two versions, you probably won't be able to unpack your program and see what's inside of it. Um, one thing I will say is that a lot of these unpacking, unpacking programs that you just Google for and you try to download um, come from less than reputable sites, and there have been many times when they actually contain malware when, inside them. So obviously if you're going to be running one of these, you know, be careful, do it in a VM, and so on. Uh, the nice thing about the unpackers is since they're made specifically for a certain version of a packer, um, you don't, uh, or sorry, you may be able to execute the malware afterwards. You may be able to take it and run it, uh, do dynamic analysis, run it in a VM or, or whatever you want to. So if you can find this method, this is definitely the easiest way to go. Um, it's going to be uh, the, give you the fewest headaches. When this, when you can't find a program that specifically is used to unpack whatever you're going up against, your next step is our generic unpackers. Now these are basically programs which automate the manual techniques we're going to talk about. Um, unfortunately, they often need to actually execute the program in order to unpack it. So you definitely want to be using one of these in a VM uh, and not on your corporate workstation or whatever you have. Um, in all likelihood, you will not be able to execute the program afterwards, the, the malware that you're unpacking. Um, so just keep that in mind. But you know, if you can't find a uh, specific unpacker for whatever you're going up against, this is uh, definitely one way to go. Um, one of the, I don't, I don't think I have links to this at the end, but one of the ones that I like is called GNPacker. Um, it works fairly well, especially um, against things like UPX and some of the more, other more common packers that are out there. You basically just give the program, you tell it to unpack, and then it'll dump the file to disk and then you can look at it. This one does actually need to run the program in order to execute, oh, I'm sorry, run the program in order to unpack it, so you want to be careful uh, with that. But. So let's say you don't have a VM. Let's say you know you, you can't find an unpacking or a generic unpacker, and you know, or you found one and it doesn't work, and you don't want to do this on your own. You know, what where do you go from here? 
Well, there are actually services online where you can give them a binary and they'll attempt to unpack it for you. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about these services is that they use very advanced uh, techniques that basically have been described in academic graduate uh, papers and theses and, and things like that. Um, but they work fairly well, too. Um, thing to keep in mind is, first off, there's no guarantee that it's actually going to work. Or, uh, and there's no guarantee of a time frame in which you're going to get it back. Um, typically, you're looking at, if you're lucky, a you know an hour turnaround time in order to get your uh, information back or get the results back. Sometimes it could be as long as a day, depending on you know, what mode they're on. Um, <clears throat> in addition to this, the results are going to be publicly shared and available. And that what that means is, anything you send up to it. Um, anybody is going to be able to go and see the results from that. They're going to be able to download the MPAC program. Uh, many of these services actually take the MPAC program too and perform some static analysis on like doing a strings analysis. So, you know, the concern is if you're going, if you've been, uh, if you're a victim of a targeted attack and you need to unpack that program, you may not want to send it to one of these services, you know, because other people are going to be looking at it. These programs are being shared uh, with antivirus vendors and other researchers. And pretty soon you're going to, you know, find yourself in the news because, you know, oh, hey, you know, we found this binary or somebody submitted this binary that has, you know, strings specific to company X in it. Um, if you followed the Google Aurora attacks, um, one of the reasons that uh, a lot of the researchers found the exact file that was sent to Google to compromise them was somebody from Google actually uploaded it to VirusTotal. And a couple months later, somebody figured out, hey, there's this file that was sent to Google um, and it came from Google. So like uh, where a lot of news generated uh, after that attack. Um, the two services that I know of that are fairly decent are one's called the Ether Unpacking Service, the other is called the Eureka Unpacking Service. Uh, both work very well. Um, there are very few packers that they can't get around, but you know, again, your mileage may vary. So after these three methods, really all you're left to, left to do is manually unpacking the malware. You know, sometimes there's not a specific unpacker for you to use. <clears throat> sometimes there's the generic unpackers aren't working, and let's say maybe you don't want to use one of the online services. What you're left with is uh, doing it yourself or like, hiring somebody to do it for you. Um, <clears throat> so this can actually be a very time-consuming process, especially when you're first starting out, um, because you're going to be going through and you're going to be restarting a lot. Um, there are many times where, I, where I'm going through and I'm trying to unpack a program manually and I, you know, miss a step, I, I hit the wrong button, I have to restart from the beginning, um, or, you know, it could have like a very advanced packer in it which has a, throws a lot of curveballs at you that you have to try to get around one by one. A good example of this are uh, the Zeus Trojans. Um, they typically come packed with this packer that's a huge pain in the ass to get around. Um, there are a couple of tricks to doing it, but it's it's not fun. It's going to take you a while to get around until you figure out the tricks. But there are essentially three steps that you're going to go through. <clears throat> First, we're going to find the original original entry point. <laughs> this is going to be the point in the, our original program that uh, where it's executing. You know, this is where we want to get to. Then we're going to dump the image. What I mean by this is we're going to take the original program that's running in memory at that point, and we're going to put it to disk. And then finally, we're going to rebuild the import table, the import address table, to allow us to actually execute it again. So I'm going to skip over this. Um, Doug really went into these. Uh, these are, this is just a debugger cheat sheet um, for various things that you can do in a debugger. Um, I'm just going to skip over that. So those are our three steps. So step one, finding the original entry point. The thing you have to understand with Packers is, at some point, as it's running, the packer has to give control back to the original program. I mean, that's its point. You know, it, the whole point of a packer is to protect the original program, but at some point it has to let the original program run. And that's the point we want to get to, because that's the program we want to look at. Because at that point, in theory, the original program has been un fully uncompressed, is loaded in memory, and we can analyze it. Now, there are lots of ways you can do this. You can do what's called single stepping, which is essentially going through every single instruction until you get to a point that you think is the original entry point. It's a very valid way to go, but it takes forever. Um, you can put breakpoints on various APIs. Um, like Doug showed you, uh, you know, the whole list of very uh, different uh, functions that you could breakpoint on to find different things. You can do that here too. 
Uh, typically when you do this, you want to do things like um, put a breakpoint on a function that's typically called at the beginning of a program. Something like get command line or you know, virtual alloc, which is going to act allocate memory for various things. Um, you can break point on the import address table. So as the packer is running, it's going to be rebuilding that import address table. And if you can find out where that is in memory, you can put a break point on that so that when the packer writes to it, um, it, will, uh, it will pause the program. And then you can go in and kind of trace the forward or back based off of that. And there are lots more methods. Each, you know, more and more complex and more and more difficult to run and are useful in various strategies. But one way that I found that I really like is called quick single stepping. So when packers run, um, typically what they'll do is they'll save all the registers to the stack before they start. Um, Doug showed you all the different registers that were in a program, which was like the AX, EAX register, EBX, and so on. Packers will save everything, uh, it basically saves the state that the computer is in before they begin executing. And then once it's done and it's ready to jump to the original program, it's going to restore that state. It's going to restore all those registers. So what we have to do really is just look for uh, a section in the, in the packing code where it's pushing multiple registers to the stack to save them, or a special instruction called push AD, which basically just pushes every register to the stack. If we see that, then we have to look for the corresponding section, which is just popping everything off the stack to restore it all. Um, or we can look for another uh, special instruction called pop AD, which basically just pulls that information from the stack and puts them into the uh, registers. If you see this, um, shortly after that, you should see a jump or a call instruction, and that is likely going to be leading you to the original entry point. So we're actually going to go through an example because it's e a lot easier to see by doing this. So can everybody see this okay? So I'm actually using a debugger called Immunity Debugger. Um, Doug was using one called Ollie Debug. They're both very good. Um, Immunity Debugger is actually based off of, like you said, uh, the source code of um, of Ali Debug. Uh, it has a couple uh, things in there which are helpful, especially if you're doing exploit analysis, um, such as they've uh, uh, Python. It has been uh, integrated directly into it, so you can actually run Python code against the assembly and, and different things like that. Um, but what we have here is our UPX pack program. This was the one that just pops up the hello world type message. Um, the very first thing we see here is a push AD. So the very first thing the packer is doing is pushing all of the registers to the stack. And actually so we can see that. Down here we have the stack. I'm going to single step through this push AD program and what's going to happen is we're going to see a value added here, hopefully. Yeah. So all these values that were added, these are all the values of the various registers up here. So we know that at this point in time up here, the packer is pushing everything uh, up to this uh, stack in order to save the state of the program. So what we want to do is we want to find the corresponding pop AD, um, since it used push AD. So the easiest way to do it is uh, do control F, which is find. I'm going to search for pop AD, and hey, here we go. All the way down here, we have pop AD. Now, this isn't a foolproof method. You know, a program could have multiple pop ADs. Um, I've seen packers which put pop ADs in there which really don't do anything and they're there to screw you up. Um, but UPX is pretty easy to analyze. So, uh, and, and if we have time, I'm going to show you a different one which is a little more complex. But um, here's our pop AD. Uh, I'm going to hit F F2 to um, put a breakpoint on here so that once it hits, uh, once the program hits that uh, instruction, it'll stop. And I'll hit F9, or actually, I'll, do this. I'll go up here, hit play, and hey, we're lucky. We can see down here that we have a breakpoint. Those in the back probably can't see this, but there's a little status message that says we broke right here. Now, when you're doing um, reverse engineering, especially in a debugger, and especially with manual unpacking, a lot of times you'll do what I just did, hit play, and then the malware will start to infect your system because it had to jump somewhere. Um, that went to somewhere else or it skipped over this pop AD. So we got lucky here. So looking down, we see a couple of things. Um, the next message is loading something in the memory that we're pushing and we're comparing. And we see a jump here. Um, you know, this is doing a jump short. You can move this over. It's hard to see, but 
the little arrow here is showing you that it's actually jumping down here, where this little uh, greater than sign is. Um, and then below that, we have it subtracting stuff off the stack and then jumping again. So it's probably a good indication that this um, jump right here is to our original entry point, or at least close to our original entry point. But I'm just going to single step through um, just to be sure. Um, the reason I'm doing that is, you know, this jump, you know, could do something funky like um, it doesn't look like it's going to do here, but I've seen uh, code which will actually modify this code down here. And so this jump not zero changes to something else. And if we put a breakpoint down here, we would totally miss that. So I'm just going to go through one instruction at a time, see what happens. We get to this jump and it jumps up, all right? And it's going through and it's doing something. So I don't want to sit here and do that up forever. So I want to put a breakpoint on the next instruction and just run. We got through that. We didn't, you know, we didn't see that little hello world message pop up, so we know that we're still in the packer. We're good. Go one more. And here we're about to execute this jump. <clears throat> now, the one thing that I forgot to say was when you're unpacking malware, you're going to be setting uh, uh, breakpoints all over the place. You cannot leave those breakpoints in. When you, in a debugger, what a breakpoint typically does is it, it's actually changing this instruction to a specific instruction, uh, the hex code CC, which means it's a debugging exception, which the debugger essentially catches and stops the program from running. So if we would dump this program uh, to disk right now, we would have breakpoints in here and we try to run it and it would error out. Um, so we want to unset these breakpoints. So I just unset them. All right, now we're at this instruction. We haven't executed it yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into it. And here we're at another, uh, pro another part of the program. Now, the thing about UPX, and you wouldn't know this um, really right away, is that after it does the original jump that we just you know, went through, it actually calls another uh, uh, function and then jumps to another place. And this other place right here, this is the original entry point. So I'm going to allow it to do this last call, one more jump, and now we're at the original entry point. Um, this is the point in a UPX program where we're actually executing the original program. So what I want to do is I want to copy down that address. The, we have original entry point equals 40105E. Okay. The reason I want to copy this down is we're going to need to know this value later. Um, in the debugger, we're not going to do anything else. You know, it's at the point in the program in memory where we want to keep it, so we're just going to leave it where it is. I'm just going to minimize this. Actually, I'm just going to jump up really fast back to the presentation. So these next couple slides is basically go through what I just showed you. We we know that there's a push AD in the UPX program, so that means that there's likely a pop AD somewhere towards the end of the code. Uh, we hit the control F to find the pop AD, and we found it. We put a breakpoint down there. We see the jump later on. Eventually, get to that uh, breakpoint. Uh, we go. We follow the jump, and we get to that little stub code that we saw where it called something and then jumped. We go through this, and we finally get back to our original entry point. All right. Our next step is that we're going to dump the image to disk. So, see what we're doing is we're taking the program that's in memory, and we're going to put it on disk because it's been unpacked at that point. So then we can. So now we can perform analysis on it. Um, there are lots of tools that we can use to do this. Ollie Debug and Immunity, they have uh, different plugins that you can add into it, which allow you to dump uh, a program to disk. Um, there's a program called, that we're going to use called Import Reconstructor, which is fairly well. Um, or you can do this manually, which is a huge pain in the butt to do. You essentially have to write your own program, which goes through and iterates through memory and, and does it. It's horrible, actually, to do. Um, if you go to VM like this, you can actually you know, pause the VM, grab it, or dump the entire memory. Uh, to disk and use a program like Volatility to uh, extract the memory and so on. So there are lots of different ways that you can do this. Um, one thing to keep in mind is some packers will actually make this difficult to actually just dump the, the memory to disk. They'll, they'll modify the permissions on various memory structures and various regions of memory within the, its own program so that you can't actually dump the program. Um, it becomes very difficult to do at that point. What we're going to do is we're going to use a program called Import Reconstruct. Uh, I, should, I should have said too at the beginning, um, we're actually using, uh, this is on Windows, I mean, we're on Windows 7, but we're 32 bit. I think Immunity will run under 64 bit. I don't know. Will it? 
in compatibility mode, I think okay. it'll, it'll open 32-bit compile executable. Okay. So natively in 64-bit, none of these programs will probably work. Um, I've never tried it before. Um, there are debuggers that are specifically made for 64-bit and so on, but we're all just dealing with 32-bit here. So what we want to do is we want to dump our process to disk. So in import reconstructor, there's a little tab up here that lists every single process that's in memory. So we want to find ours. So ours is here, UPXS Hello World. Click that, then it loads all this stuff for various things and so on. <coughs> so in order for us to dump this to disk, all we do is right click here, go to advanced commands, select code sections, just leave everything like it is, and click full dump. And then you tells you that's where you want to dump it to, what the name is, I'm just gonna save it, and it's done. So What we have over here is we've got a program dumped directly from memory. Now, uh, you know, we can do a comparison on this. You know, let's look at this, the embedded strings. Here's the original packed program, and here is the one we just dumped. What we can see is, if we start scrolling down, there are a lot more pro there are a lot more strings in this one than the uh, packed version. Now we're seeing lots of different error messages. We're seeing that it was compiled with Visual C++. Um, we've got some more uh, uh, functions here. Scroll down, we're gonna see more things and so on and so forth. And in fact, if we scroll down some more, we're gonna see some Unicode strings. Over here, this tells you whether it's an ASCII or Unicode string. Uh, in our original program, there was no Unicode strings. Here, we're actually seeing some. So what we have is we have the, uh, the unpacked program on disk. Now, this is where you would stop if you just wanted to look inside a program, if you wanted visibility. If we actually go and try to execute this, we get an error because the original entry point is pointing to some other section, the import address table hasn't been uh, restored, and so there are lots of things screwed up within the executable that won't let us run it. So let's say we wanted to fix that. So let's say we actually did want to execute it. We want to rebuild the import table. Um, so to do this, we're going to we're going to go back and we're going to use import reconstructor to rebuild it. Basically, we want to find the import address table in memory, the reconstructed one, and modify the program um, that we just dumped to point to the correct uh, places. So the easiest way to actually do this is to go back into the debugger. <coughs> So remember when I said that the import address table is essentially a lookup table for um, um, external functions? Well, eventually your original program is going to be calling some of these functions. So all we have to do is start looking through the code until we find um, some external function that's being called. And that's actually going to point to a memory address somewhere in our program where the import address table is. So if we look down here, we see a call down here. This is to, um, it's hard to see, but it's a function call to kernel32.getStartupInfo. What we have here on the left side, right here, is a memory address. And this memory address is where the, uh, is into the import address table. When, when we go down here, let's see, I'm going to, I want to pull up this uh, memory address in the dump down here. We actually see all these names of functions. Essentially what we have here is this value right here in memory, the 76ED, yeah, 76ED 7CB5, that's the memory address uh, of get startup info in memory. Um, if, if we would have looked here when it was on disk, this would have all been filled in with zeros. The comment over here is something put in by, um, uh, by immunity debugger. So if we scroll down, See lots of different um, functions. So here we found our import address table. What you want to do is you want to go to the very top and see what the address of that is. Okay, the address of that is 408000. 
So now we know our import address table is at 408000. And we need to find out how big it is. We just scroll down until we don't see anything else. Get to right here. Um, it always ends on uh, zeros. We see that the uh, ending is uh, 408 ec So we know that the length or table size is EC. So now we've got the information that we need. We know where our original entry point address is, we know where our import address table is, and we know how big that table is. So all we need to do now is reconstruct that within our, uh, the program that we dumped from disk. And uh, Import Reconstructor can do all that for us. So down here, we need to enter in uh, what we had for our original entry point. So we've got 405, 401.05e. Now, it's actually uh, asking, actually, it actually wants the uh, relative virtual address. So we need to take our image base, which is 400,000, and subtract this from it, so we get 105e. And then we need the relative virtual address of our import address table. So our import edge table is 408000, subtract 400,000 from that, and we get 8,000. <coughs> and then the size is EC. So does everybody understand you know, where we got all this information from and what it is? Again, I know, you know I'm going through this very quickly, and you know, there, are, there are classes which last weeks or a week long to teach you all of this. So I'm going through it very fast. But once we have this information, we just click Get Imports. And up here, it loads the imports on there. If for some reason we messed up, what we would see, so let's say we got the size wrong. We'll say, uh, click Get Imports. We see uh, what's up here is called uh, thunks. These are just uh, essentially uh, additional sections, which are invalid. All we'd have to do is go up here, Cut the um, invalid thumbs. Maybe. Try to delete them. There. And now we have our correct um, address table. I'm going to go ahead and change this back. So we still need to fix the uh, program that we dumped to a uh, disk. So what I'll do is you just click Fix Dump, find the program. open and you see it'll tell you that it dumped it successfully. It actually just saves it with an underscore at the end and now we have our program. So in theory if we did this correctly we have this program here which we've dumped from memory to disk so we can see all the embedded strings which we've already seen but since we restored the original entry point and the import address table we should be able to run this. So hopefully for now runs. And then we can do things like Again, we could you know, throw it into Ida Pro, which is a disassembler. And then we could actually start looking at the code, doing more reverse engineering, and so on. This just basically goes through what I did. So, you know, once you get to this point, you can files fixed, it can be executed, analyzed, whatever you want to do. This was a very easy example. I mean, it may not have looked like that if you've never done this before, but um, there are other packers out there which add protections to uh, the, um, the program and make it really difficult in order to unpack. Um, they throw, you know, various curveballs at you, or it's, you know, it's even difficult just to find the original entry point. Now, fortunately, there are a couple of resources out there that help you. Um, I highly recommend checking out this uh, presentation from RuxCon in 2006. It's a great um, PowerPoint, which just basically goes through everything that I did in way more in depth, and probably explains a lot better than I did. Um, if, you, uh, if you're a programmer um, uh, and you want to start looking at this, I highly recommend looking at something called Titan Engine, 
which is essentially a API for uh, C++ API to uh, unpack um, programs. They have uh, they basically allow you to create your own unpacking programs. Um, the engine is very well written. I've seen people write programs which can unpack uh, packers, which are extremely difficult to to get around. Um, so that's really all I have. Um, I, I understand. I, I realize that, especially if you're new to reversing and malware analysis, and, you, and this is the first time you've looked at a debugger. This a lot of this stuff probably you know was totally out there. Um, but I guess the, the one thing that I you know like to, everybody to take away is you know if you do come across malware and you do need to analyze it, there are ways to get around the protections that the bad guys put in place. Um, this is just one way to do it. You know, this is how to get around the, the, unpack, the packing programs that they use. Um, sometimes you know you don't have a program which will do it for you, so you have to go through and do it yourself. Um, are there any questions? Um, so there's lots of encryptors in that kind of the market. If you were actually trying to create your own executables and put it through a encryptor to actually practice your debugging skills, is there a encryptor you recommend that you know, does some so are you asking for a packer to use yeah. to test? Um, I would definitely start with UPX. Um, there's another one called FSG, which is uh, a few years old. Um, that's a really good one. That's our uh, Russian one, um, but it's actually you know very good in it. So you know there I guess there there are different you know levels of difficulty to go through. You know UPX is probably the easiest one out there because the source code's available. It's open source. And, it's, and as we just stepped through, it's on the scale of packers, it's fairly easy to unpack. Uh, but it's a great thing to, cu to cut your teeth on. Now then I'd look at uh, either FSG or another one called MEW, M-E-W. Um, those are, uh, they, they kind of step it up a little bit, but not enough that it's even more difficult. When you want to get into the ones that are really difficult, uh, look for one called the Mita. Um, that one is a huge pain in the butt. Whoever, it's actually a commercial packer that you can uh, buy. Um, but it's extremely difficult to unpack. In fact, it implements its own virtual virtualization engine. So it takes the original code and actually virtualizes it. So you have to not only, um, and it actually never runs the original code, it just runs the virtualized version of it. So you literally, in order to unpack something, you have to write uh, or find a program which decompiles the Mita's virtualization in order to see what it's doing with you know, your, the original code. The Mita, T H E M I D A. Yeah, T H E M I D A. It's actually a commercial product that you can buy, but there are a couple of pirated versions out there which people have used, um, and there are lots more. Just honestly, just search for Packers, and you'll find multiple websites that have um, you know, ones that you can download. If you get on any of the um, the Script Kitty malware forums, people are creating their own all the time. Um, they'll throw them out there. Usually, they're either called Packers or uh, or more like encryptors, which are they're essentially the same thing as a packer, packer instead, uh, where they um, they encrypt the program instead of uh, compressing it. And one more question. Uh, so you're just running like UMQ or VBox or VMRs along those lines. Do you do anything as far as that, like, guest operating system as far as hiding its presence to make it a little bit easier to unpack? Hiding the virtual machine itself or hiding the, the guest operating system? Well, it's basically like hiding the fact that UMQ, you know, like, like says, I am a human hard disk involved in the right. nice little piece of malware that says I'm not running a virtualized environment, so you have to use my payload or any call right. in the network or that kind of fun stuff. Um, you know, I, I was running VirtualBox here. I mean, there are some things that I do um, to hide the virtual machine from the malware. Um, typically, I won't install the virtual machine guest tools. So, you know, there's VMware tools and VirtualBox has its own version. Typically, I won't install those. I, I Honestly, I, I haven't used QEMU much, so I'm um, not as familiar with what you can do with that. Um, but it, some of the virtual machine detection algorithms that are used are, some of them are very easy or are very simple where they just look for like the VMware tools and memory. Um, others are more complex where they actually perform assembly level checks to see, you know, if they're in a virtual machine or not. It's kind of like the red or the, yeah, the red pill, blue pill stuff from Joanna Rakowski that came out uh, a couple years ago. Um, honestly, if you just, in my experience, most of the time, if you don't install the, tool, the virtual machine tools, um, it's going to be enough to get around most malware. Um, and I honestly, I think most attackers now are realizing that a lot of 
companies are virtualizing their environments, so it doesn't make sense for them to not run on virtualization or in virtualization. Um, instead, I'm seeing them move more towards looking for specific programs in memory, like process monitor, or um, yeah, process monitor or, or capture that. Or some of the other tools, Ida Pro or Alibaba, <coughs> make sure that they're not running in that. Um, and, and Honestly, you could give you know a two-day course on how to get around those. Um, but, but honestly, you know, just Google that, and you'll find a bunch of really good papers on how to get around some of that stuff. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you. Can I take a quick poll? Yeah. Um, how many people found tonight's topics interesting? Because we're always gauging. Wow. Good. Yeah. Good to know. Because we're always gauging like what kind of things should we have to bring in speakers to talk about. We didn't know if this was going to be a hit or miss talking about reversing stuff. But you guys Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. And um, especially for those who are new to the group, you know, what we try to do is have a um, more, a, a, I guess, intro, entry, beginner level uh, talk, and then a more advanced talk um, to kind of hit everybody's you know interest. So I am just going to jump into the end of the meeting stuff, and I don't have the. Uh, so I'm just going to wing it. So.